over the years, lots of people proposed animation schemes with my stuff. It always came to naught. I, I did not, not want to commit myself to fighting with people for five years to turn out a cartoon, an animated cartoon, that I, I'm sure would still be a compromise. American cartoonist Robert Crumb is the subject of a first-ever museum retrospective at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. A centerpiece of the exhibit is another first, an interactive animated work done in collaboration with Belgian artist Frédéric Durieux. So with this thing with Frédéric, it just kind of happened serendipitously. It happened by circumstance. This whole thing came about due to my Yenta wife, as usual. She's, she's gotten me in so many situations, <laughs> including this one. Mr. Crum and his wife Aileen live a famously reclusive life in a village in France, where Aileen runs a gallery that exhibited Mr. Durieux's artworks. This is a technology I developed 10 years ago to animate a picture of, for example, an animal or a body, or whatever you want. The puppet become alive on the screen. Mr. Durieux lives nearby in a chateau built in 1664 on a 14-acre estate, where he developed software for art. It was mostly here that the two artists would brainstorm on their project. I'm not a computer guy, not a tech guy at all. I'm, no, you know, I'm a 19th century type person. <laughs> <laughs> Later I find out that the guy spends like a thousand hours just playing with code numbers, you know, to get this thing to move on the screen. I realized from what he had done on the computer that he had basically taken the body parts of the horse or this woman and to articulate them. And then going through all my just old stuff, I ran across this thing where I'd made these puppets of two characters, Mr. Natural and Angel Food Mix Spade, in a comic in 1970 where I actually had separated their limbs and everything to make a, a puppet you could cut out of paper and stick together. It was, yeah, kind of take off on a kid cutout thing that they used to do when I was a kid in the 40s and 50s. And, and I showed that to Frederick. He said, that's perfect. I can use that. The curtains open and Angel Foot is on the stage, and the music starts, and she's dancing for, for us. It doesn't need a fully worked out, fleshed out storyline, you know, because it's interactive and it's, it's all time to this piece of music, this old time Martinique orchestra playing. So it's just, it's kind of like a Max Fleischer cartoon from the early 30s that, that's based on a piece of music, like he, would have Betty Boop, and the whole thing is all about this, uh, you know, you rascal you, or some old jazz tune, it's great. And, you know, he'd have the title would appear, and then music would start, and then a curtain would open, just like on a stage. This was, you know, inspired by vaudeville and stage acts, and early cartoons. In that work, Angel Food, it's a bit like Josephine Baker in the, in the 20s or the 30s when she was dancing in the Folie Bergère in Paris on that kind of music. And I tried to make the same, barely the same movement for her on, when she's dancing. He came to my house and, and you know, we talked about the music and I said, well, try this and try that. What do you think of this? And then I played some black jazz records of the 20s and, and the Martinique stuff which has a more tropical rhythm. And he really liked that, and Natalie really liked it too, I think. <laughs> I think that had a lot to do with it. You know, my wife is from the West Indies, and we decided to use that music for the, the, the work we will do together. Some of the suggestions that I had and that, and that Frederic thought up for the erotic interaction between the characters, it's not for everybody, you know. I'd say that, you know, parental guidance would be, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> suggested. Yeah, I, I don't know what you'd call those characters. I guess they're racial, I don't know. Like they're, they're just uh, more psychic or astral than they are racial. I'm sure it'll offend some people. Some people will be offended. Others will see it for the ironic, you know, 
whatever it is that it is, and the, it involves an ironic take on the, on the old stereotype, and yet, at the same time, there's something real about it. It's subtle. It's subtle what it's about. I don't know. I put stuff out there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it means. I, I don't, you know, if you try and analyze it too much, you analyze yourself out of doing it, you know. God, it lay it on the table. I mean, I grew up with it. I grew up, my grandmother was a horrible racist bigot. Got to exercise that stuff somehow. But, okay, it looks so racist on the face, and it's, I suppose, you know, some people are very hypersensitive about that, and some black people, it's just painful. They, don't, they just don't want to see that. I can understand that. Don't want to see even an ironic, you know, version of this image. They don't want to see it. But, you know, as a, as a white American, sorry, I got to do it. What the implications are of this, I have no idea. I have no idea where something like this could go. Interactive, where is that going? You know, perhaps in the next generation they'll create a computer hologram that you can like interact with, have sex with or whatever. Who knows? Who knows where that's going? <laughs> Me, I, it's not, not my world. That's not, you know, I'm, I'm still going to continue just to do my thing with pens and paper as I've always done that's, you know, arc, seems kind of archaic already, but, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm stuck with. And that's, I'm fine with that. I'm, you know, I'm down with that.